Chapter Fifteen of Emily Bronte by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Wuthering Heights. The Story. Part One. On the summit of Haworth Hill, beyond the street, stands a grey stone house which is shown as the original of Wuthering Heights. A few scant and wind baffled ash trees grow in front the moors rise at the back stretching away for miles it is a house of some pretensions once the parsonage of grimshaw that powerful wesleyan preacher who whip in hand used to visit the black bull on sunday morning and lash the merrymakers into chapel to listen to his sermon somewhat fallen from its former pretensions it is a farmhouse now with much such an oak-lined and stone-floored house as is described in wuthering heights over the door there is moreover a piece of carving h e sixteen fifty nine a close enough resemblance to hareton earnshaw fifteen hundred but the wilderness of crumbling griffins and shameless little boys are nowhere to be found neither do we notice the excessive slant of a few stunted firs at the end of the house and a range of gaunt thorns all stretching their limbs one way as if craving alms of the sun and to my thinking this fine old farm of sounds is far too near the mills of haworth to represent the god-forsaken lonely house of emily's fancy having seen the place as in duty bound one returns more than ever impressed by the fact that while every individual and every sight in charlotte's novels can be clearly identified emily's imagination and her power of drawing conclusions are alone responsible for the character of her creations this is not saying that she had no data to go upon had she not seen Soudens and many more such houses she would never have invented wuthering heights the story and passion of branwell set on her fancy to imagine the somewhat similar story and passion of heathcliff but in the process of her work the nature of her creations completely overmastered the facts and memories which had induced her to begin these were but the handful of dust which she took to make her man and the qualities and defects of her masterpiece are both largely accounted for when we remember that her creation of character was quite unmodified by any attempt at portraiture therefore in wuthering heights it is with a story a fancy picture that we have to deal in drawing and proportion not unnatural but certainly not painted after nature to quote her sister's beautiful comments wuthering heights was hewn in a wild workshop with simple tools out of homely materials the statuary found a granite block on a solitary moor gazing thereon he saw how from the crag might be elicited a head savage swart sinister a form moulded with at least one element of grandeur power he wrought with a rude chisel and from no model but the vision of his meditations with time and labour the crag took human shape and there it stands colossal dark and frowning half statue half rock in the former sense terrible and goblin-like in the latter almost beautiful for its colouring is of mellow grey and moorland moss clothes it and heath with its blooming bells and balmy fragrance grows faithfully close to the giant's foot of the rude chisel we find plentiful traces in the first few chapters of the book the management of the narrative is singularly clumsy introduced by a mr lockwood a stranger to the north an imaginary misanthropist who has taken a grange on the moor to be out of the way of the world and afterwards continued to him by his housekeeper to amuse the long leisures of a winter illness but passing over this initial awkwardness of conception we find a manner equal to the matter and somewhat resent charlotte's eloquent comparison for there are touches fine and delicate that only a practised hand may dare to give and there is feeling in the book not only terrible and goblin-like but patient and constant sprightly and tender consuming and passionate we find getting over the inexperienced beginning 
that the style of the work is noble and accomplished and that far from being a half-hewn and casual fancy a head surmounting a trunk of stone its plan is thought out with scientific exactness no line blurred no clue forgotten the work of an intense and poetic temperament whose vision is too vivid to be incongruous the first four chapters of wuthering heights are merely introductory they relate mr lockwood's visit there his surprise at the rudeness of the place in contrast with the foreign air and look of breeding that distinguishes mr heathcliff and his beautiful daughter-in-law he also noticed the profound moroseness and ill-temper of everybody in the house overtaken by a snowstorm he was however constrained to sleep there and was conducted by the housekeeper to an old chamber long unused where since at first he could not sleep he amused himself by looking over a few mildewed books piled on one corner of the window ledge they in the ledge were scrawled all over with writing catherine earnshaw sometimes varied to catherine heathcliff and again to catherine linton nothing save these three names are written on the ledge but the books were covered in every fly-leaf and margin with a pen and ink commentary a sort of diary as it proved scrawled in childish hand mr lockwood spent the first portion of the night in deciphering this faded record a string of childish mishaps and deficiencies dated a quarter of a century ago evidently this catherine earnshaw must have been one of heathcliff's kin for he figured in the narrative as her fellow scapegrace and the favourite scapegoat of her elder brother's wrath after some time mr lockwood fell asleep to be troubled by harassing dreams in one of which he fancied that this childish catherine earnshaw or rather her spirit was knocking and scratching at the fur scraped window-pane begging to be let in overcome with the intense horror of nightmare he screamed aloud in his sleep waking suddenly up he found to his confusion that his yell had been heard for heathcliff appeared exceedingly angry that any one had been allowed to sleep in the oak closeted room if the little fiend had got in at the window she probably would have strangled me i returned catherine linton or earnshaw or however she was called she must have been a changeling wicked little soul she told me she had been walking the earth these twenty years a just punishment for her mortal transgressions i've no doubt scarcely were these words uttered when i recollected the association of heathcliff's with catherine's name in the books i blushed at my inconsideration but without showing further consciousness of the offence i hastened to add the truth is sir i passed the first part of the night in here i stopped afresh i was about to say perusing those old volumes then it would have revealed my knowledge of their written as well as their printed contents so i went on in spelling over the name scratched on that window ledge a monotonous occupation calculated to set me asleep like counting or what can you mean by talking in this way to me thundered heathcliff with savage vehemence how how dare you under my roof god he's mad to speak so and he struck his forehead with rage i did not know whether to resent this language or pursue my explanation but he seemed so powerfully affected that i took pity and proceeded with my dreams heathcliff gradually fell back into the shelter of the bed as i spoke finally sitting down almost concealed behind it i guessed however by his irregular and intercepted breathing that he struggled to vanquish an excess of violent emotion not liking to show him that i had heard the conflict i continued my toilet rather noisily and soliloquized on the length of the night not three o'clock yet i could have taken oath it had been six time stagnates here we must surely have retired to rest at eight always at nine in winter and rise at four said my host suppressing a groan and as i fancied by the motion of his arm's shadow dashing a tear from his eyes mr lockwood he added you may go into my room you'll only be in the way coming downstairs so early take the candle and go where you please 
I shall join you directly. Keep out of the yard, though. The dogs are unchained, and the house, Juno mounts sentinel there, and, nay, you can only ramble about the steps and passages, but away with you. I'll come in two minutes. I obeyed so far as to quit the chamber, when, ignorant where the narrow lobbies led, I stood still and was witness involuntarily to a piece of superstition on the part of my landlord, which belied oddly his apparent sense. He got on to the bed and wrenched open the lattice, bursting, as he pulled at it, into an uncontrollable passion of tears. Come in, come in, he sobbed. Cathy, do come. Oh, my heart's darling, hear me this time, Catherine, at last. The spectre showed a spectre's ordinary caprice. It gave no sign of being. But the snow and wind whirled wildly through, even reaching my station, and blowing out the light. There was such anguish in the gush of grief that accompanied this raving, that my compassion made me overlook its folly, and I drew off half angry to have listened at all, and vexed at having related my ridiculous nightmare, since it produced that agony the why was beyond my comprehension. Mr. Lockwood got no clue to the mystery at Wuthering Heights, and later on returned to Thrushcross Grange to fall ill of a lingering fever. During his recovery he heard the history of his landlord from his housekeeper, who had been formerly an occupant of Wuthering Heights, and after that for many years the chief retainer at Thrushcross Grange, where young Mrs. Heathcliff used to live when she still was Catherine Linton. Do you know anything of Mr. Heathcliff's story? said Mr. Lockwood to his housekeeper, Nellie Dean. It's a cuckoo, sir, she answered. It is at this point that the history of Wuthering Heights commences, that violent, bitter history of the little dark thing harbored by a good man to his bane, carried over the threshold as Christabel lifted Geraldine out of pity for the weakness which having grown strong shall crush the hand that helped it, carried over the threshold as evil spirits are carried, powerless to enter of themselves, and yet no evil demon, only a human soul, lost and blackened by tyranny, injustice, and congenital ruin. The story of Wuthering Heights is the story of Heathcliff. It begins with the sudden journey of the old squire Mr. Earnshaw to Liverpool one summer morning at the beginning of harvest. He had asked the children each to choose a present, only let it be little, for I shall walk there and back sixty miles each way. And the son Hindley, a proud, high-spirited lad of fourteen, had chosen a fiddle, six-year-old Cathy, a whip, for she could ride any horse in the stable, and Nellie Dean, their humble playfellow and runner of errands, had been promised a pocketful of apples and pears. It was the third night since Mr. Earnshaw's departure, and the children, sleepy and tired, had begged their mother to let them sit up a little longer, yet a little longer, to welcome their father and see their new presence. At last, just about eleven o'clock, Mr. Earnshaw came back, laughing and groaning over his fatigue, and opening his great coat, which he held bundled up in his arms, he cried, See here, wife, I was never so beaten with anything in my life, but you must e'en take it as a gift of God, though it's as dark almost as if it came from the devil. We crowded round, and over Miss Cathy's head I had a peep at a dirty, ragged, black-haired child, big enough both to walk and talk, indeed, its face looked older than Catherine's, yet when it was set on its feet it only stared round and repeated over and over again some gibberish that nobody could understand. I was frightened, and Mrs. Earnshaw was ready to fling it out of doors, she did fly up asking how he could fashion to bring that gypsy brat into the house when they had their own bairns to feed and fend for. What he meant to do with it, and whether he were mad. The master tried to explain the matter, but he was really half dead with fatigue, and all that I could make out amongst her scolding was a tale of his seeing it starving and houseless, and as good as dumb, in the streets of Liverpool, where he picked it up and inquired for its owner. Not a soul knew to whom it belonged, he said, and his money and time being both limited, he thought it better to take it home with him at once than run into vain expenses there, because he was determined he would not leave it as he found it. 
so the child entered Wuthering Heights, a cause of dissension from the first. Mrs. Earnshaw grumbled herself calm. The children went to bed crying, for the fiddle had been broken and the whip lost in carrying the little stranger for so many miles. But Mr. Earnshaw was determined to have his protege respected. He cuffed saucy little Cathy for making faces at the newcomer, and turned Nellie Dean out of the house for having set him to sleep on the stairs because the children would not have him in their bed. And when she ventured to return some days afterwards, she found the child adopted into the family and called by the name of a son who had died in childhood, Heathcliff. Nevertheless, he had no enviable position. Cathy, indeed, was very thick with him, and the master had taken to him strangely, believing every word he said, for that matter he said precious little and generally the truth, but Mrs. Earnshaw disliked the little interloper and never interfered in his behalf when Hindley, who hated him, thrashed and struck the sullen, patient child who never complained, but bore all his bruises in silence. This endurance made old Earnshaw furious when he discovered the persecutions to which this mere baby was subjected, the child soon discovered it to be a most efficient instrument of vengeance. I remember Mr. Earnshaw once bought a couple of colts at the parish fair and gave the lads each one. Heathcliff took the handsomest, but it soon fell lame, and when he discovered it, he said to Hindley, You must exchange horses with me. I don't like mine, and if you don't, I shall tell your father of the three thrashings you've given me this week and show him my arm which is black to the shoulder. Hindley put out his tongue and cuffed him over the ears. You'd better do it at once, he persisted, escaping to the porch. They were in the stables. You'll have to, and if I speak of these blows, you'll get them back with interest. Off, dog, cried Hindley, threatening him with an iron weight used for weighing potatoes and hay. Throw it, he replied, standing still, and then I'll tell how you boasted you would turn me out of doors as soon as he died, and see whether he will not turn you out directly. Hindley threw it, hitting him on the breast, and down he fell, but staggered up immediately, breathless and white, and had not I prevented it, he would have gone just so to the master and got full revenge by letting his condition plead for him, intimating who had caused it. Take my colt, gypsy, then, said young Earnshaw, and I pray that he may break your neck, take him and be damned, you beggarly interloper, and wheedle my father out of all he has, only afterwards show him what you are, imp of Satan, and take that, I hope he'll kick out your brains. Heathcliff had gone to loose the beast and shift it to his own stall. He was passing behind it when Hindley finished his speech by knocking him under its feet and without stopping to examine whether his hopes were fulfilled, ran away as fast as he could. I was surprised to witness how coolly the child gathered himself up and went on with his intention, exchanging saddles and all, and then sitting down on a bundle of hay to overcome the qualm which the violent blow occasioned, before he entered the house. I persuaded him easily to let me lay the blame of his bruises on the horse. He heeded little what tale was told, so that he had what he wanted. He complained so seldom, indeed, of such things as these, that I really thought him not vindictive. I was deceived completely, as you will hear. So the division grew. This malignant, uncomplaining child with foreign skin and eastern soul could only breed discord in that Yorkshire home. He could not understand what was honourable by instinct to an English mind. He was quick to take an advantage, long-suffering, sly, nursing his revenge in silence like a vindictive slave, until at last the moment of retribution should be his, sufficiently truthful and brave to have grown noble in another atmosphere, but with a ready bent to underhand and brooding vengeance. Insensible, it seemed, to gratitude, proud with the unreasoning pride of an Oriental, cruel and violently passionate. One soft and tender speck there was in this dark and sullen heart. It was an exceedingly great and forbearing love for the sweet, saucy, naughty Catherine. But this one affection only served to augment the mischief that he wrought. 
he who had estranged son from father husband from wife severed brother from sister as completely for hindley hated the swarthy child who was cathy's favourite companion when mrs earnshaw died two years after heathcliff's advent hindley had learned to regard his father as an oppressor rather than a friend and heathcliff as an intolerable usurper so from the very beginning he bred bad feeling in the house in the course of time mr earnshaw began to fail his strength suddenly left him and he grew half childish irritable and extremely jealous of his authority he considered any slight to heathcliff as a slight to his own discretion so that in the master's presence the child was deferred to and courted from respect for that master's weakness while behind his back the old wrongs the old hatred showed themselves unquenched and so the child grew up bitter and distrustful matters got a little better for a while when the untamable hindley was sent to college yet still there was disturbance and disquiet for mr earnshaw did not love his daughter catherine and his heart was yet further embittered by the grumbling and discontent of old joseph the servant the wearisomest self-righteous pharisee that ever ransacked a bible to take the promises to himself and fling the curses to his neighbours but catherine though slighted for heathcliff and nearly always in trouble on his account was much too fond of him to be jealous the greatest punishment we could invent for her was to keep her separate from heathcliff certainly she had ways with her such as i never saw a child take up before and she put all of us past our patience fifty times and oftener in a day from the hour she came downstairs till the hour she went to bed we hadn't a minute's security that she wouldn't be in mischief her spirits were always at high water mark her tongue always going singing laughing and plaguing everybody who would not do the same a wild wicked slip she was but she had the bonniest eye the sweetest smile and the lightest foot in the parish and after all i believe she meant no harm for when once she made you cry in good earnest it seldom happened that she wouldn't keep your company and oblige you to be quiet that you might comfort her in play she liked exceedingly to act the little mistress using her hands freely and commanding her companions suddenly this pretty mischievous sprite was left fatherless mr earnshaw died quietly sitting in his chair by the fireside one october evening mr hindley now a young man of twenty came home to the funeral to the great astonishment of the household bringing a wife with him a rush of a lass spare and bright-eyed with a changing hectic colour hysterical and full of fancies fickle as the winds now flighty and full of praise and laughter now peevish and languishing for the rest the very idol of her husband's heart a word from her a passing phrase of dislike for heathcliff was enough to revive all young earnshaw's former hatred of the boy heathcliff was turned out of their society no longer allowed to share cathy's lessons degraded to the position of an ordinary farm servant at first heathcliff did not mind cathy taught him what she learned and played or worked with him in the fields cathy ran wild with him and had a share in all his scrapes they both bade fair to grow up regular little savages while hindley earnshaw kissed and fondled his young wife utterly heedless of their fate an adventure suddenly changed the course of their lives one sunday evening cathy and heathcliff ran down to thrushcross grange to peep through the windows and see how the little lintons spent their sundays they looked in and saw isabella at one end of the to them splendid drawing-room and edgar at the other both in floods of tears peevishly quarrelling so elate were the two little savages from wuthering heights at this proof of their neighbour's inferiority that they burst into peals of laughter the little lintons were terrified and to frighten them still more cathy and heathcliff made a variety of frightful noises they succeeded in terrifying not only the children but their silly parents who imagined the yells to come from a gang of burglars determined on robbing the house they let the dogs loose in this belief and the bulldog seized cathy's bare little ankle for she had lost her shoes in the bog while heathcliff was trying to throttle off the brute the man-servant came up 
and taking both the children prisoner conveyed them into the lighted hall there to the humiliation and surprise of the lintons the lame little vagrant was discovered to be miss earnshaw and her fellow miss deminent that strange acquisition my late neighbour made in his journey to liverpool a little lascar or an american or spanish castaway cathy stayed five weeks at thrushcross grange by which time her ankle was quite well and her manners much improved young mrs earnshaw had tried her best during this visit to endeavour by a judicious mixture of fine clothes and flattery to raise the standard of cathy's self-respect she went home then a beautiful and finely dressed young lady to find heathcliff in equal measure deteriorated the mere farm servant whose clothes were soiled with three months service in mire and dust with unkempt hair and grimy face and hands heathcliff you may come forward cried mr hindley enjoying his discomfiture and gratified to see what a forbidding young blackguard he would be compelled to present himself you may come and wish miss catherine welcome like the other servants cathy catching a glimpse of her friend in his concealment flew to embrace him she bestowed seven or eight kisses on his cheek within the second and then stopped and drawing back burst into a laugh exclaiming why how very black and cross you look and how how funny and grim but that's because i'm used to edgar and isabella linton well heathcliff have you forgotten me shake hands heathcliff said mr earnshaw condescendingly once in a way that is permitted i shall not replied the boy finding his tongue at last i shall not stand to be laughed at i shall not bear it from this time catherine's friendship with heathcliff was checkered by intermittent jealousy on his side and intermittent disgust upon hers and for this evil turn far more than for any coarser brutality heathcliff longed for revenge on hindley earnshaw meanwhile edgar linton greatly smitten with the beautiful catherine went from time to time to visit at wuthering heights he would have gone far oftener but he had a terror of hindley earnshaw's reputation and shrank from encountering him for this fine young oxford gentleman this proud young husband was sinking into worse excesses than any of his wild earnshaw ancestors a defiant sorrow had driven him to desperation in the summer following catherine's visit to thrushcross grange his only son and heir had been born an occasion of great rejoicings suddenly dashed by the discovery that his wife his idol was sinking fast in consumption hindley refused to believe it and his wife kept her flighty spirits till the end but one night while leaning on his shoulder a fit of coughing took her a very slight one she put her two hands about his neck her face changed and she was dead hindley grew desperate and gave himself over to wild companions to excesses of dissipation and tyranny his treatment of heathcliff was enough to make a fiend of a saint heathcliff bore it with sullen patience as he had borne the blows and kicks of his childhood turning them into a lever for extorting advantages the aches and wants of his body were redeemed by a fierce joy at heart for in this degradation of hindley earnshaw he recognized the instrument of his own revenge time went on ever making a sharper difference between this gypsy hind and his beautiful young mistress time went on leaving the two fast friends enough but leaving also in the heart of heathcliff a passionate rancour against the man who of set purpose had made him unworthy of catherine's hand and of the other man on whom it was to be bestowed for edgar linton was infatuated with the naughty tricksy young beauty of wuthering heights her violent temper did not frighten him although his own character was singularly sweet placid and feeble her compromising friendship with such a mere boor as young heathcliff was only a trifling annoyance easily to be excused and when his own father and mother died of a fever caught in nursing her he did not love her less for the sorrow she brought a fever she had wilfully taken in despair and a sudden sickness of life one evening pretty cathy came into the kitchen to tell nelly dean that she had engaged herself to marry edgar linton 
heathcliff unseen was seated on the other side of the settle on a bench by the wall quite hidden from those at the fireside cathy was very elated but not at all happy edgar was rich handsome young gentle passionately in love with her still she was miserable nelly dean who was nursing the baby hareton by the fire finally grew out of patience with her whimsical discontent your brother will be pleased she said the old lady and gentleman will not object i think you will escape from a disorderly comfortless home into a wealthy respectable one and you love edgar and edgar loves you all seems smooth and easy where is the obstacle here and here replied catherine striking one hand on her forehead and the other on her breast in whichever place the soul lives in my soul and in my heart i'm convinced i'm wrong that's very strange i cannot make it out it's my secret but if you will not mock at me i'll explain it i can't do it distinctly but i'll give you a feeling of how i feel she seated herself by me again her countenance grew sadder and graver and her clasped hands trembled nelly do you never dream queer dreams she said suddenly after some minutes reflection yes now and then i answered and so do i i've dreamt in my life dreams that have stayed with me ever after and changed my ideas they've gone through and through me like wine through water and altered the colour of my mind and this is one i'm going to tell it but take care not to smile at any part of it oh don't miss catherine i cried we are dismal enough without conjuring up ghosts and visions to perplex us she was vexed but she did not proceed apparently taking up another subject she recommenced in a short time if i were in heaven nelly i should be extremely miserable because you are not fit to go there i answered all sinners would be miserable in heaven but it is not that i dreamt once that i was there i tell you i won't hearken to your dreams miss catherine i'll go to bed i interrupted again she laughed and held me down for i made a motion to leave my chair this is nothing cried she i was only going to say that heaven did not seem to be any home and i broke my heart with weeping to come back to earth and the angels were so angry that they flung me out into the middle of the heath on the top of wuthering heights where i woke sobbing for joy that will do to explain my secret as well as the other i've no more business to marry edgar linton than i have to be in heaven and if the wicked man in there hadn't brought heathcliff so low i shouldn't have thought of it it would degrade me to marry heathcliff now so he shall never know how i love him and that not because he's handsome nelly but because he's more myself than i am whatever our souls are made of his and mine are the same and linton's is as different as a moonbeam from lightning or frost from fire ere this speech ended i became sensible of heathcliff's presence having noticed a slight movement i turned my head and saw him rise from the bench and steal out noiselessly he had listened till he had heard catherine say that it would degrade her to marry him and then he stayed to hear no further my companion sitting on the ground was prevented by the back of the settle from remarking his presence or departure but i started and bade her hush why she asked gazing nervously round joseph is here i answered catching opportunely the, the roll of his cart-wheels up the road and heathcliff will be coming in with him unfortunate creature as soon as you become mrs linton he loses friend and love and all have you considered how you'll bear the separation and how he'll bear to be quite deserted in the world because miss catherine he quite deserted we separated she exclaimed with an accent of indignation who is to separate us pray they'll meet the fate of milo not as long as i live ellen for no mortal creature every linton on the face of the earth might melt into nothing before i could consent to forsake heathcliff my great miseries in this world have been heathcliff's miseries and i watched and felt each from the beginning my great thought in living is himself 
if all else perished and he remained i should still continue to be and if all else remained and he were annihilated the universe would turn to a mighty stranger i should not seem a part of it my love for linton is like the foliage in the woods time will change it i am well aware as winter changes the trees my love for heathcliff resembles the eternal rocks beneath a source of little visible delight but necessary nelly i am heathcliff he's always always in my mind not as a pleasure any more than i am always a pleasure to myself but as my own being so don't talk of our separation again it is impracticable and she paused and hid her face in the folds of my gown but i jerked it forcibly away i was out of patience with her folly poor cathy beautiful haughty and capricious who should guide and counsel her her besotted drunken brother the servant who did not love her and was impatient of her weathercock veerings no and heathcliff who brutalized and rude as he was at least did love and understand her heathcliff who had walked out of the house her rejection burning in his ears not to enter it till he was fitted to exact both love and vengeance he did not come back that night though the thunder rattled and the rain streamed over wuthering heights though cathy shawless in the wind and wet stood calling him through the violent storms that drowned and baffled her cries all night she would not leave the hearth but lay on the settle sobbing and moaning all soaked as she was with her hands on her face and her face to the wall a strange augury for her marriage these first dreams of her affianced love not dreams indeed but delirium for the next morning she was burning and tossing in fever near to death's door as it seemed but she won through and edgar's parents carried her home to nurse as we know they took the infection and died within a few days of each other nor was this the only ravage that the fever made catherine always hasty and fitful in temper was henceforth subject at rare intervals to violent and furious rages which threatened her life and reason by their extremity the doctor said she ought not to be crossed she ought to have her own way and it was nothing less than murder in her eyes for any one to presume to stand up and contradict her but the strained temper the spoiled authoritative ways the saucy caprices of his bride were no blemishes to edgar linton's eyes he was infatuated and believed himself the happiest man alive on the day he led her to gimmerton chapel three years subsequent to his father's death despite so many gloomy auguries the marriage was a happy one at first catherine was petted and humoured by every one with edgar for a perpetual worshipper his pretty weak-natured sister isabella as an admiring companion and for the necessary spectator of her happiness nelly dean who had been induced to quit her nursling at wuthering heights suddenly heathcliff returned not the old heathcliff but a far more dangerous enemy a tall athletic well-formed man intelligent and severe a half-civilized ferocity lurked yet in the depressed brows and eyes full of black fire but it was subdued and his manner was even dignified though too stern for grace a formidable rival for boyish edgar linton with his only son's petulance constitutional timidity and weak health cathy though she was really attached to her husband gave him cruel pain by her undisguised and childish delight at heathcliff's return he had a presentiment that evil would come of the old friendship thus revived and would willingly have forbidden heathcliff the house but edgar so anxious lest any cross be given to his wife with a double reason then for tenderly guarding her health could not inflict a serious sorrow upon her with only a baseless jealousy for its excuse thus heathcliff became intimate at thrushcross grange the second house to which he was made welcome the second hearth he meant to ruin at this time he was lodging at wuthering heights on his return he had first intended he told catherine just to have one glimpse of your face a stare of surprise perhaps and pretended pleasure afterwards settle my score with hindley and then prevent the law by doing execution on myself End of 
Chapter 15, Part 1. Chapter 15, Part 2 of Emily Bronte by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Wuthering Heights, The Story, Part 2. Catherine's welcome changed his plan. Her brother was safe from Heathcliff's violence, but not from his hate. The score was being settled in a different fashion. Hindley, who was eager to get money for his gambling and who had drunk his wits away, was only too glad to take Heathcliff as lodger, boon companion, and fellow card player at once. And Heathcliff was content to wait and take his revenge sip by sip, encouraging his old oppressor in drink and gaming, watching him lose acre after acre of his land, knowing that sooner or later Earnshaw would lose everything and he, Heathcliff, be master of Wuthering Heights with Hindley's son for his servant. Revenge is sweet. Meanwhile, Wuthering Heights was a handy lodging at walking distance from the Grange. But soon his visits were cut off. Isabella Linton, a charming girl of eighteen with an espiegle face and a thin sweetness of disposition that could easily turn sour, Isabella Linton fell in love with Heathcliff. To do him justice, he had never dreamed of marrying her until one day Catherine, in a fit of passion, revealed the poor girl's secret. Heathcliff pretended not to believe her, but Isabel was her brother's heir and to marry her, inherit Edgar's money, and ill-use his sister would indeed be a fair revenge on Catherine's husband. At first it was merely as an artistically pleasurable idea, a castle in the air to be dreamed about, not built, that this scheme suggested itself to Heathcliff. But one day, when he had been detected in an experimental courting of Isabel, Edgar Linton, glad of an excuse, turned him out of doors. Then, in a paroxysm of hatred, never satisfied revenge and baffled passion, Heathcliff struck with the poisoned weapon ready to his hand. He persuaded Isabel to run away with him, no difficult task, and they eloped together one night to be married. Isabella, poor, weak, romantic, sprightly Isabel, was not missed at first, for very terrible trouble had fallen upon the Grange. Catherine, in a paroxysm of rage at the dismissal of Heathcliff, quarrelled violently with Edgar and shut herself up in her own room. For three days and nights she remained there, eating nothing, Edgar secluded in his study, expecting every moment that she would come down and ask his forgiveness. Nellie Dean, who alone knew of her determined starving, resolved to say nothing about it, and conquer once for all the haughty and passionate spirit which possessed her beautiful young mistress. So three days went by. Catherine still refused all her food, and unsympathetic Ellen still resolved to let her starve, if she chose without remonstrance. On the third day Catherine unbarred her door and asked for food, and now Ellen Dean was too frightened to exult. Her mistress was wasted, haggard, wild, as if by months of illness, the too presumptuous servant remembered the doctor's warning and dreaded her master's anger when he should discover Catherine's real condition. On this servant's obstinate cold-heartedness rests the crisis of Wuthering Heights. Had Ellen Dean at the first attempted to console the violent childish Catherine, had she acquainted Edgar of the real weakness underneath her pride, Catherine would have had no fatal illness and left no motherless child, and had moping Isabel, instead of being left to weep alone about the park and garden, been conducted to her sister's room and shown a real sickness to nurse, a real misery to mend, she would not have gone away with Heathcliff and wedded herself to sorrow out of a fanciful love and idleness. It is characteristic of Emily Bronte's genius that she should choose so very simple and homely a means for the production of most terrible results. A fit she had had, alone and untended, during those three days of isolated starvation, had unsettled Catherine's reason. The gradual coming on of her delirium is given with a masterly pathos that Webster need not have made more strong, nor Fletcher more lovely and appealing. A minute previously she was violent. Now, supported on one arm, and not noticing my refusal to obey her, 
she seemed to find childish diversion in pulling the feathers from the rents she had just made in the pillows and ranging them on the sheet according to their different species her mind had strayed to other associations that's a turkey's she murmured to herself and this is a wild duck's and this is a pigeon's ah they put pigeon's feathers in the pillows no wonder i couldn't die let me take care to throw it on the floor when i lie down and here's a moorcock's in this i should know it among a thousand it's a lapwing's bonny bird wheeling over our heads in the middle of the moor it wanted to get to its nest for the clouds had touched the swells and it felt rain coming this feather was picked up from the heath the bird was not shot we saw its nest in the winter full of little skeletons heathcliff set a trap over it and the old ones dare not come i made him promise he'd never shoot a lapwing after that and he didn't yes here are more did he shoot my lapwings nelly are they red any of them let me look give over with that baby work i interrupted dragging the pillow away and turning the holes toward the mattress for she was removing its contents by handfuls lie down and shut your eyes you're wandering there's a mess the down is flying about like snow i went here and there collecting it i see in you nelly she continued dreamily an aged woman you have gray hair and bent shoulders this bed is the fairy cave under peniston crag and you are gathering elf bolts to hurt our heifers pretending while i am near that they are only locks of wool that's what you'll come to fifty years hence i know you are not so now i'm not wandering you're mistaken or else i should believe you really were that withered hag and i should think i was under peniston crag and i'm conscious it's night and there are two candles on the table making the black press shine like jet the black press where is that i asked you are talking in your sleep it's against the wall as it always is she replied it does appear odd i see a face in it there's no press in the room and never was said i resuming my seat and looping up the curtain so i might watch her don't you see that face she inquired gazing earnestly at the mirror and say what i could i was incapable of making her comprehend it to be her own so i rose and covered it with a shawl it's behind there still she pursued anxiously and it stirred who is it i hope it will not come out when you are gone oh nelly the room is haunted i'm afraid of being alone i took her hand in mine and bid her be composed for a succession of shudders convulsed her frame and she would keep straining her gaze toward the glass there's nobody here i insisted it was yourself mrs linton you knew it a while since myself she gasped and the clock is striking twelve it's true then that's dreadful her fingers clutched the clothes and gathered them over her eyes this scene was the beginning of a long and fearful brain fever from which owing to her husband's devoted and ceaseless care catherine recovered her life but barely her reason that hung in the balance a touch might settle it on the side of health or of madness not until the beginning of this fever was isabella's flight discovered her brother was too concerned with his wife's illness to feel as heartbroken as heathcliff hoped he was not violent against his sister nor even angry only with the mild steady persistence of his nature he refused to hold any communication with heathcliff's wife but when at the beginning of catherine's recovery ellen dean received a letter from isabella declaring the extreme wretchedness of her life at wuthering heights where heathcliff was master now edgar linton willingly accorded the serpent permission to go and see his sister arrived at wuthering heights she found that once plentiful homestead sorely ruined and deteriorated by years of thriftless dissipation and isabella linton already metamorphosed into a wan and listless slattern broken-spirited and pale as a pleasant means of entertaining his wife and her old servant heathcliff discoursed on his love for catherine and on his conviction that she could not really care for edgar linton catherine has a heart as deep as i have the sea could be as readily contained in that horse trough as her whole affection monopolized by him Tush he is scarcely a degree dearer to her than her dog or her horse it is not in him to be loved like me 
how can she love in him what he has not nelly dean unhindered by the sight of isabella's misery or by the memory of the wrongs her master already suffered from this estimable neighbour was finally cajoled into taking a letter from him to the frail half-dying catherine appointing an interview for heathcliff persisted that he had no wish to make a disturbance or to exasperate mr linton but merely to see his old playfellow again to learn from her own lips how she was and whether in anything he could serve her the letter was taken and given the meeting came about one sunday when all the household save ellen dean were at church catherine pale apathetic but more than ever beautiful in her mazed weakness of mind and body heathcliff violent in despair seeing death in her face alternately upbraiding her fiercely for causing him so much misery and tenderly caressing the altered dying face never was so strange a love scene it is not a scene to quote not noticeable for its eloquent passages or the beauty of casual phrases but for its sustained passion desperate pure terrible it must be read in its sequence and its entirety nor can i think of any parting more terrible more penetrating in its anguish than this romeo and juliet part but they have known each other but for a week there is no scene that heathcliff can look upon in which he has not played with catherine and now that she is dying he must not watch with her troilus and cressida part but cressida is false and troilus has his country left him what country has heathcliff the outcast nameless adventurer antonio and his duchess but they have belonged to each other and been happy these two are eternally separate their passion is only heightened by its absolute freedom from desire even the wicked and desperate heathcliff has no ignoble love for catherine all he asks is that she live and that he may see her that she may be happy even if it be with linton i would never have banished him from her society while she desired his asserts heathcliff and now she is mad with grief and dying the consciousness of their strained and thwarted natures moreover makes us the more regretful they must sever had he survived romeo would have been happy with rosalind after all probably juliet would have married paris but where will heathcliff love again the perverted morose brutalized heathcliff whose only human tenderness has been his love for the capricious lively beautiful young creature now dazed now wretched now dying in his arms the very remembrance of his violence and cruelty renders more awful the spectacle of this man sitting with his dying love silent their faces hid against each other and washed by each other's tears at last they parted catherine unconscious half dead that night her puny seven months child was born that night the mother died unutterably changed from the bright imperious creature who entered that house as a kingdom not yet a year ago by her side in the darkened chamber her husband lay worn out with anguish outside dashing his head against the trees in a berserker wrath with fate heathcliff raged not to be consoled her senses never returned she recognized nobody from the time you left her i said she lies with a sweet smile upon her face and her latest ideas wandered back to pleasant early days her life closed in a gentle dream may she wake as kindly in the other world may she wake in torment he cried with frightful vehemence stamping his foot and groaning in a paroxysm of ungovernable passion why she's a liar to the end where is she not there not in heaven not perished where oh you said you cared nothing for my sufferings and i pray one prayer i repeat it till my tongue stiffens catherine earnshaw may you not rest as long as i am living you said i killed you haunt me then the murdered do haunt their murderers i believe i know that ghosts have wandered on earth be with me always take any form drive me mad only do not leave me in this abyss where i cannot find you oh god it is unutterable i cannot live without my life i cannot live without my soul he dashed his head against the knotted trunk and lifting up his eyes howled not like a man but like a savage beast being goaded to death with knives and spears i observed several splashes of blood about the bark of the tree and his hand and forehead were both stained 
probably the scene i witnessed was the repetition of others acted during the night it hardly moved my compassion it appalled me from this time a slow insidious madness worked in heathcliff when it was at its height he was not fierce but strangely silent scarcely breathing hushed as a person who draws his breath to hear some sound only just not heard as yet as a man who strains his eyes to see the speck on the horizon which will rise the next moment the next instant and grow into the ship that brings his treasure home when i sat in the house with hareton it seemed that on going out i should meet her when i walked on the moors i should meet her coming in when i went from home i hastened to return she must be somewhere at the heights i was certain and when i slept in her chamber i was beaten out of that i couldn't lie there for the moment i closed my eyes she was either outside the window or sliding back the panels or entering the room or even resting her darling head on the same pillow as she did when a child and i must open my lids to see and so i opened and closed them a hundred times a night to be always disappointed it was a strange way of killing not by inches but by fractions of hair-breaths to beguile me with the spectre of a hope through eighteen years this mania of expectation stretching the nerves to their uttermost strain relaxed sometimes and then heathcliff was dangerous when filled with the thought of catherine the world was indifferent to him but when this possessing memory abated ever so little he remembered that the world was his enemy had cheated him of catherine then avarice ambition revenge entered into his soul and his last state was worse than his first cruel with the insane cruelty the blood mania of an etzeline he never was his cruelties had a purpose the sufferings of the victims were a detail not an end yet something of that despot's character refined into torturing the mind and not the flesh chaste cruel avaricious of power something of that southern morbidness in crime distinguishes heathcliff from the villains of modern english tragedies placed in the italian renaissance with cyril tourneur for a chronicler heathcliff would not have awakened the outburst of incredulous indignation which greeted his appearance in a nineteenth-century romance soon after the birth of the younger catherine isabella heathcliff escaped from her husband to the south of england he made no attempt to follow her and in her new home she gave birth to a son linton the fruit of timidity and hatred fear and revulsion from the first she reported him to be an ailing peevish creature meanwhile little catherine grew up the very light of her home an exquisite creature with her father's gentle constant nature inspired by a spark of her mother's fire and lightened by a gleam of her wayward caprice she had the earnshaw's handsome dark eyes and the linton's fair skin regular features and curling yellow hair that capacity for intense attachments reminded me of her mother still she did not resemble her her anger was never furious her love never fierce it was deep and tender cathy was in truth a charming creature though less passionate and strange in nature than catherine earnshaw not made to be loved as wildly nor as deeply mistrusted edgar grown a complete hermit devoted himself to his child who spent a life as happy and secluded as a princess in a fairy story seldom venturing outside the limits of the park and never by herself edgar had never forgotten his sorrow for the death of his young wife he loved her memory with steady constancy if and i think we may if we allow that every author has some especial quality with which in more or less degree he endows all his children if we grant that shakespeare's people are all meditative even the sprightly rosalind and the clownish dogberry if we allow that all our acquaintances and dickens are a trifle self-conscious in george eliot conscientious to such an extent that even tito milema feels remorse for conduct which granted his period and his character would more naturally have given him satisfaction then we must allow that emily bronte's special mark is constancy passionate insane constancy in heathcliff perverse but intense in the elder catherine steady and holy in edgar linton even the hard and narrow ellen dean even joseph the hypocritical pharisee are constant until death 
while Hindley Earnshaw drinks himself to death for grief at losing his consumptive wife, Hareton loves to the end the man who has usurped his place, degraded him, fed him on blows and exaction, and it is constancy and absence that embitters and sickens the younger Catherine. Even Isabella Heathcliff, weak as she is, is not fickle. Even Linton Heathcliff, who of all the characters in fiction may share with Barnes Newcombe the bad eminence of supreme unlovableness, even he loves his mother and Catherine, and in his selfish way loves them to the end. The years passed, nothing happened, save that Hindley Earnshaw died, and Heathcliff, to whom every yard had been mortgaged, took possession of the place. Hareton, who should have been the first gentleman in the neighborhood, being reduced to a state of complete dependence on his father's inveterate enemy, lives as a servant in his own house, deprived of the advantages of wages, quite unable to right himself because of his friendlessness and his ignorance that he has been wronged. The eventless years went by till Catherine was thirteen, when Mrs. Heathcliff died, and Edgar went to the south of England to fetch her son. Little Cathy, during her father's absence, grew impatient of her confinement in the park. There was no one to escort her over the moors, so one day she leaped the fence, got lost, and was finally sheltered at Wuthering Heights, of which place, and of all its inmates, she had been kept in total ignorance. She promised to keep the visit a secret from her father, lest he should dismiss Ellen Dean. She was very indignant at being told that rudely bred Hareton was her cousin, and when that night Linton, delicate, pretty, pettish Linton, arrived, she infinitely preferred his cousinship. The next morning she found Linton gone, his father having sent for him to Wuthering Heights. Edgar Linton, however, did not tell his daughter that her cousin was so near. He would not for worlds she should cross the threshold of that terrible house. But one day Cathy and Ellen Dean met Heathcliff on the moors, and he half persuaded, half forced them to come home and see his son, grown a most despicable, puling, ailing creature, half violent, half terrified. Cathy's kind little heart did not see the faults. She only saw that her cousin was ill, unhappy, in need of her. She was easily entrapped, one winter when her father and Ellen Dean were both ill, into a secret engagement with this boy cousin, the only lad save uncouth Hareton whom she had ever seen. Every night, when her day's nursing was done, she rode over to Wuthering Heights to pet and fondle Linton. Heathcliff did all he could to favor the plan. He knew his son was dying, notwithstanding that every care was taken to preserve the air of Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. It is true that Cathy had a rival claim. To marry her to Linton would be to secure the title, get a wife for his dying son to preserve the line of inheritance, and certainly to break Edgar Linton's heart. Heathcliff's love of revenge and love of power combined to make the scheme a thing to strive for and desire. He grew desperate as the boy got weaker and weaker. It was but too likely that he would die before his dying uncle, and if Edgar Linton survived, Thrushcross Grange was lost to Heathcliff. As a last resource, he made his son write to Edgar Linton and beg for an interview on neutral ground. Edgar, who, ignorant of Linton Heathcliff's true character, saw no reason why Cathy should not marry her cousin if they loved each other, allowed Ellen Dean to take her little mistress, now seventeen years old, on to the moors, where Linton Heathcliff was to meet them. Cathy was loath to leave her father even for an hour, he was so ill, but she had been told Linton was dying, so nerved herself to go once more on the moors. They found Linton in a strange state, terrified, exhausted, despondent, making spasmodic love to Cathy as if it were a lesson he had been beaten into learning. She wished to return, but the boy declared himself and looked too ill to go back alone. They escorted him home to the heights, and Heathcliff persuaded them to enter, saying he would go for a doctor for his sick lad. But once they were in the house, he showed his hand. The doors were bolted, the servants and Hareton away. Neither tears nor prayers would induce him to let his victims go till Catherine was Linton's wife, and so he told her till her father had died in solitude. But five days after, Catherine Linton, now Catherine Heathcliff, 
contrived an escape in time to console her father's dying hours with a false belief in her happiness a noble lie for edgar linton died contented kissing his daughter's cheek ignorant of the misery in store for her the next day heathcliff came over to the grange to recapture his prey but now catherine did not mind her father dead she received all the affronts and stings of fate with an enduring apathy it was only her that they injured a few days after linton died in the night alone with his bride after a year's absolute misery and loneliness catherine's lot was a little lightened by mr heathcliff's preferring ellen dean to the vacant post of housekeeper at wuthering heights for the all-absorbing presence of catherine earnshaw had nearly secluded heathcliff from enmity with the world he was seldom violent now he became yet more and more disinclined to society sitting alone seldom eating often walking about the whole night his face changed and the look of brooding hate gave way to a yet more alarming expression an excited wild unnatural appearance of joy he complained of no illness yet he was very pale bloodless and his teeth visible now and then in a kind of smile his frame shivering not as one shivers with chill or weakness but as a tight-stretched cord vibrates a strong thrilling rather than trembling at last his mysterious absorption the stress of his expectation became so intense that he could not eat animated with hunger he would sit down to his meal then suddenly start as if he saw something glance at the door or the window and go out weary and pale he could not sleep but left his bed hurriedly and went out to pace the garden till break of day it is not my fault he replied that i cannot eat or rest i assure you it is through no settled design i'll do both as soon as i possibly can but you might as well bid a man struggling in the water rest within arm's length of the shore i must reach it first and then i'll rest as to repenting of my injustices i've done no injustice and i repent of nothing i'm too happy and yet i'm not happy enough my soul's bliss kills my body but does not satisfy itself meanwhile the schemes of a life the deeply laid purposes of his revenge were toppling unheeded all around him like a house of cards his son was dead hareton earnshaw the real heir of wuthering heights and catherine the real heir of thrushcross grange had fallen in love with each other a most unguessed at and unlikely finale yet most natural for catherine was spoiled accomplished beautiful proud yet most affectionate and tender-hearted and hareton rude surly ignorant fierce yet true as steel staunch and with a very loving faithful heart constant even to the man who had of set purpose brutalized him and kept him in servitude hareton is damnably fond of me laughed heathcliff you'll own that i've outmatched hinley there if the dead villain could rise from the grave to abuse me for his offspring's wrongs i should have the fun of seeing the said offspring fight him back again indignant that he should dare to rail at the one friend he has in the world he'll never be able to emerge from his bathos of coarseness and ignorance cried heathcliff in exultation but love can do as much as hatred heathcliff himself as great a boor at twenty contrived to rub off his clownishness in order to revenge himself upon his enemies catherine linton's love inspired hareton to as great an effort this odd rough love story as harshly sweet as whortleberries as dry and stiff in its beauty as purple heather sprays is the most purely human the only tender interest of wuthering heights it is the necessary and lawful anticlimax to heathcliff's triumph the final reassertion of the preeminence of right conquered good and conquering ill is often pitiably true but not an everlasting law only a too frequent accident perceiving this emily bronte shows the final discomfiture of heathcliff who kinless and kithless was in the end compelled to see the property he has so cruelly amassed descend to his hereditary enemies and he was baffled not so much by cathy's and hareton's love affairs as by this sudden reaction from violence this slackening of the heartstrings which left him nerveless and anemic a prey to encroaching monomania he had spent his life in crushing the berries for his revenge in mixing that dark and maddening draught 
and when the final moment came, when he lifted it to his lips, desire had left him, he had no taste for it. I've done no injustices, said Heathcliff, and though his life had been animated by hate, revenge, and passion, let us reflect who have been his victims. Not the old squire who first sheltered him, for the old man never lived to know his favorite's baseness, and only derived comfort from his presence. Catherine Earnshaw suffered, not from the character of her lover, but because she married a man she merely liked, with her eyes open to the fact that she was thereby wronging the man she loved. You deserve this, said Heathcliff, when she was dying. You have killed yourself, because misery and degradation and death and nothing that God or Satan could inflict would ever have parted us. You, of your own free will, did it. Not the morality of Mayfair, but one whose lessons, stern and grim enough, must ever be sorrowfully patent to such erring and passionate spirits. The third of Heathcliff's victims then, or rather the first, was Hindley Earnshaw. But if Hindley had not already been a gamester and a drunkard, a violent and soulless man, Heathcliff could have gained no power over him. Hindley welcomed Heathcliff as Faustus the devil, because he could gratify his evil desires, because in his presence there was no need to remember shame, nor high purposes, nor forsaken goodness, and when the end comes, and he shall forfeit his soul, let him remember that there were two at that bargain. Isabella Linton was the most pitiable sufferer, victim we can scarcely call her, who required no deception but courted her doom, and after all, a marriage chiefly desired in order to humiliate a sister-in-law and show the bride to be a person of importance was not intolerably requited by three months of wretched misery after so much she has suffered to escape. From Edgar Linton, as we have seen, Heathcliff's blows fell aside unharming, as the executioner strokes from a legendary martyr. He never learned how secondary a place he held in his wife's heart, he never knew the misery of his only daughter, misery soon to be turned into joy. He lived and died, patient, happy, trustful, unvisited by the violence and fury that had their center so near his hearth. The younger Catherine and Hareton suffered but a temporary ill. The misery they endured together taught them to love. The tyrant's rod had blossomed into roses. And he, lonely and palsied at heart, eating out his soul in bitter solitude, he saw his plans of vengeance all frustrated, so much elaboration so simply counteracted, it was he that suffered. He suffered now, and Catherine Earnshaw, who helped him to ruin by her desertion, and Hindley, who perverted him by early oppression, they suffered at his hands. But not the sinless, the constant, the noble, misery in the end shifts its dull mists before the light of such clear spirits ta drusanti puthein it is a poor conclusion is it not said heathcliff an absurd termination to my violent exertions i get levers and mattocks to demolish the two houses and train myself to be capable of working like hercules and when everything is ready and in my power i find the will to lift a slate off either roof has vanished five minutes ago hareton seemed to be a personification of my youth not a human being I felt to him in such a variety of ways that it would have been impossible to have accosted him rationally. In the first place, his startling likeness to Catherine connected him fearfully with her. That, however, which you may suppose the most potent to arrest my imagination, is in reality the least. For what is not connected with her to me, and what does not recall her? I cannot look down to the floor, but her features are shaped in the flags in every cloud, in every tree, filling the air by night, and caught by glimpses, in every object by day, I am surrounded by her image. The most ordinary faces of men and women, my own features, mock me with a resemblance. The entire world is a dreadful collection of memoranda that she did exist, and that I have lost her. Well, Hareton's aspect was the ghost of my immortal love, of my wild endeavors to hold my right, my degradation, my pride, my happiness, and my anguish. But it is frenzy to repeat these thoughts to you. Only it will let you know why, with a reluctance to be always alone, his society is no benefit, rather an aggravation of the constant torment I suffer, and it partly contributes to render me regardless how he and his cousin go on together, 
I can give them no attention any more. Sweet, forward Catherine and coy, passionate Hareton got on very prettily together. I can recall no more touching and lifelike scene than that first love-making of theirs, one rainy afternoon in the kitchen, where Nelly Dean is ironing the linen. Hareton, sulky and miserable, sitting by the fire, hurt by a gunshot wound, but yet more by the manifold rebuffs of pretty Cathy, she with all her sauciness limp in the dull wet weather coaxing him into good temper with the sweetest advancing graces it is strange that in speaking of wuthering heights this beautiful episode should be so universally forgotten and only the violence and passion of more terrible passages associated with emily bronte's name yet out of the strong cometh forth the sweet and the best honey from the dry heather bells Meanwhile, Heathcliff let them go on, frightening them more by his strange mood of abstraction than by his accustomed ferocity. He could give them no attention any more. For four days he could neither eat nor rest till his cheeks grew hollow and his eyes bloodshot, like a person starving with hunger and growing blind with loss of sleep. At last one early morning, when the rain was streaming in at Heathcliff's flapping lattice, Nellie Dean, like a good housewife, went in to shut it to. The master must be up and out, she said, but pushing back the panels of the enclosed bed, she found him there, laid on his back, his open eyes keen and fierce, quite still, though his face and throat were washed with rain, quite still, with a frightful lifelike gaze of exaltation under his brows, with parted lips and sharp white teeth that sneered, quite still and harmless now, dead and stark. Dead before any vengeance had overtaken him, other than the slow retributive sufferings of his own breast, dead, slain by too much hope and an unnatural joy. Never before had any villain so strange an end, never before had any sufferer so protracted and sinister a torment, beguiled with the spectre of a hope through eighteen years no more public nor authoritative punishment hareton passionately mourned his lost tyrant weeping in bitter earnest and kissing the sarcastic savage face that every one else shrunk from contemplating and heathcliff's memory was sacred having in the youth he ruined a most valiant defender even catherine might never bemoan his wickedness to her husband no execrations in this world or the next a great quiet envelops him. His violence was not strong enough to reach that final peace and mar its completeness. His grave is next to Catherine's and near to Edgar Linton's. Over them all the wild bilberry springs and the peat moss and heather. They do not wreck of the passion, the capricious sweetness, the steady goodness that lie beneath. It is all one to them and to the lark singing aloft. I lingered round the graves under that benign sky, watching the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells, listening to the soft wind breathing through the grass, and wondered how any one could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth. So ends the story of Wuthering Heights. The world is now agreed to accept that story as a great and tragic study of passion and sorrow, a wild picture of storm and moorland, of outraged goodness and ingratitude. The world which has crowned King Lear with immortality keeps a lesser wreath for Wuthering Heights, but in 1848 the peals of triumph which acclaimed the success of Jane Eyre had no echo for the work of Ellis Bell. That strange genius, brooding and foreboding, intense and narrow, was passed over, disregarded. One author, indeed, in one review, Sidney Dobell, in The Palladium, spoke nobly and clearly of the energy and genius of this book, but when that clarion augury of fame at last was sounded, Emily did not hear. Two years before, they had laid her in the tomb. No praise for Ellis Bell. It is strange to think that of Charlotte's two sisters, it was Anne who had the one short draft of exhilarating fame. When the tenant of Wildfell Hall was in proof, Ellis's and Acton's publisher sold it to an American firm as the last and finest production of the author of Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. 
strange that even a publisher could so blunder even for his own interest however this mistake caused sufficient confusion at cornhill to make it necessary that the famous charlotte accompanied by anne in her quality of secondary and mistakable genius should go to town and explain their separate existence no need to disturb the author of wuthering heights that crude work of apprentice hand over whose reproduction no publishers quarrelled such troublesome honours were not for her yet says charlotte i must not be understood to make these things subject for reproach or complaint i dare not do so respect for my sister's memory forbids me by her any such querulous manifestation would have been regarded as an unworthy and offensive weakness when indeed did the murmur of complaint pass those pale inspired lips failure can have come to her with no shock of aghast surprise all her plans had failed branwell's success the school her poems her strong will had not carried them on to success but though it could not bring success it could support her against despair when this last dearest strongest work of hers was weighed in the world's scales and found wanting she did not sigh resign herself and think the battle over she would have fought again but the battle was over over before victory was declared no more failures no more strivings for that brave spirit it was in july that charlotte and anne returned from london in july when the heather is in bud scarce one last withered spray was left in december to place on emily's deathbed End of chapter fifteen part two chapter sixteen of emily bronte by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami shirley while wuthering heights was still in the reviewer's hands emily bronte's more fortunate sister was busy on another novel this book has never attained the steady success of her masterpiece villette neither did it meet with the furor which greeted the first appearance of jane eyre it is indeed inferior to either work a very quiet study of yorkshire life almost pettifogging in its interest in ecclesiastical squabbles almost absurd in the feminine inadequacy of its heroes and yet surely has a grace and beauty of its own this it derives from the charms of its heroines caroline helston a lovely portrait in character of charlotte's dearest friend and shirley herself a fancy likeness of emily bronte emily bronte but under very different conditions no longer poor no longer thwarted no longer acquainted with misery and menaced by untimely death not thus but as a loving sister would fain have seen her beautiful triumphant the spoiled child of happy fortune yet in these altered circumstances shirley keeps her likeness to charlotte's hard-working sister the disguise happily baffling those who like mrs gaskell have not a pleasant impression of emily bronte is very easily penetrated by those who love her under the pathetic finery so lovingly bestowed under the borrowed splendors of a thousand a year a lovely face an ancestral manor-house we recognize our hardy and headstrong heroine and smile a little sadly at the inefficiency of this masquerade of grandeur so indifferent and unnecessary to her we recognize charlotte's sister but not the author of wuthering heights through these years we discern the brilliant heiress to be a person of infinitely inferior importance to the ill-dressed and overworked vicar's daughter imperial surely no need to wave your majestic wand we have bowed to it long ago unblinded and all its elusive splendours are not so potent as that worn-down goose-quill which you used to wield in the busy kitchen of your father's parsonage yet without that admirable portrait we should have scant warrant for our conception of emily bronte's character her work is singularly impersonal you gather from it that she loved the moors that from her youth up the burden of a tragic fancy had lain hard upon her 
that she had seen the face of sorrow close meeting that medusa glance with rigid and defiant fortitude so much we learn but this is very little a one-sided truth and therefore scarcely a truth at all charlotte's portrait gives us another view and fortunately there are still a few alive of the not numerous friends of emily bronte every trait every reminiscence paints in darker clearer lines the impression of character which shirley leaves upon us shirley is indeed the exterior emily the emily that was to be met and known thirty-five years ago only a little polished with the angles a little smoothed by a sister's anxious care the nobler emily deeply suffering brooding pitying creating is only to be found in a stray word here and there a chance memory a happy answer gathered from the pages of her work and the loving remembrance of her friends but these remnants are so direct unusual personal and characteristic this outline is of so decided a type that it affects us more distinctly than many stippled and varnished portraits do but to know how emily bronte looked moved sat and spoke we still return to shirley a host of corroborating memories start up in turning the pages who but emily was always accompanied by a rather large strong and fierce-looking dog very ugly being of a breed between a mastiff and a bulldog it is familiar to us as una's lion we do not need to be told Curervel, that she always sat on the hearth-rug of nights with her hand on his head reading a book we remember well how necessary it was to secure him as an ally in winning her affection has not a dear friend informed us that she first obtained emily's heart by meeting without apparent fear or shrinking keepers huge springs of demonstrative welcome certainly captain keeldar with her cavalier airs her ready disdain her love of independence does bring back with vivid brilliance the memory of our old acquaintance the major we recognize that pallid slimness masking an elastic strength which seems impenetrable to fatigue and we sigh recalling a passage in anne's letters recording how when rheumatism coughs and influenza made an hospital of haworth vicarage during the visitations of the dread east wind emily alone looked on and wondered why any one should be ill she considers it a very uninteresting wind it does not affect her nervous system we know her too by her kindness to her inferiors a hundred little stories throng our minds unforgotten delicacies made with her own hands for her servant's friend yet remembered visits of martha's little cousin to the kitchen where miss emily would bring in her own chair for the ailing girl anecdotes of her early rising through many years to do the hardest work because the first servant was too old and the second too young to get up so soon and she emily was so strong a hundred little sacrifices dearer to remembrance than shirley's open purse awaken in our hearts and remind us that after all emily was the nobler and more lovable heroine of the twain how characteristic too the touch that makes her scornful of all that is dominant dogmatic avowedly masculine in the men of her acquaintance and gentleness itself to the poetic philip nunley the gay boyish mr sweeting the sentimental louis the lame devoted boy cousin who loves her in pathetic canine fashion that courage too was hers not only shirley's flesh but emily's felt the tearing fangs of the mad dog to whom she had charitably offered food and water not only shirley's flesh but hers shrank from the light scarlet glowing tip of the italian iron with which she straightway cauterized the wound going quickly into the laundry and operating on herself without a word to any one emily also single-handed and unarmed punished her great bulldog for his household misdemeanors in defiance of an express warning not to strike the brute lest his uncertain temper should rouse him to fly at the striker's throat and it was she who fomented his bruises this prowess and tenderness of shirley's is an old story to us and shirley's love of picturesque and splendid raiment is not without an echo in our memories it was emily who shopping in bradford with charlotte and her friend 
chose a white stuff patterned with lilac thunder and lightning to the scarcely concealed horror of her more sober companions and she looked well in it a tall lithe creature with a grace half queenly half untamed in her sudden supple movements wearing with picturesque negligence her ample purple slashed skirts her face clear and pale her very dark and plenteous brown hair fastened up behind with a spanish comb her large grey hazel eyes now full of indolent indulgent humour now glimmering with hidden meanings now quickened into flame by a flash of indignation a red ray piercing the dew she too had shirley's taste for the management of business we remember charlotte's disquiet when emily insisted on investing miss branwell's legacies in york and midlands railway shares she managed in a most handsome and able manner for me when i was in brussels and prevented by distance from looking after our interests therefore i will let her manage still and take the consequences disinterested and energetic she certainly is and if she is not quite so tractable or open to conviction as i could wish i must remember perfection is not the lot of humanity and as long as we can regard those whom we love and to whom we are closely allied with profound and never shaken esteem it is a small thing that they should vex us occasionally by what appear to us headstrong and unreasonable notions so speaks the kind elder sister the author of shirley but there are some who will never love either type or portrait sidney dobell spoke a bitter half-truth when ignorant of shirley's real identity he declared we have only to imagine shirley keeldar poor to imagine her repulsive the silenced pride the thwarted generosity the unspoken power the contained passion of such a nature are not qualities which touch the world when it finds them in an obscure and homely woman even now very many will not love a heroine so independent of their esteem they will resent the frank imperiousness caring not to please the unyielding strength the absence of trivial submissive tendernesses for which she makes amends by such large humane and generous compassion in emily's nature says her sister the extremes of vigour and simplicity seem to meet under an unsophisticated culture in artificial taste and an unpretending outside lay a power and fire that might have informed the brain and kindled the veins of a hero but she had no worldly wisdom her powers were unadapted to the practical business of life she would fail to defend her most manifest rights to consult her legitimate advantage an interpreter ought always to have stood between her and the world her will was not very flexible and it generally opposed her interest her temper was magnanimous but warm and sudden her spirit altogether unbending so speaks emily's inspired interpreter whose genius has not made her sister popular shirley is not a favourite with a modern public emily bronte was born out of date athene leading the nymphs in their headlong chase down the rocky spurs of olympus and stopping in full career to lift in her arms the weanlings tender as dew or the chance hurt cubs of the mountain might have chosen her as her hunt fellow or brunhilde the strong falkir dreading the love of man whose delight is battle and the wild summits of hills forfeiting her immortality to shield the helpless and the weak she would have recognized the kinship of this last-born sister but we moderns care not for these our heroines are juliet desdemona and imogen our examples dorothea brooke and laura pendennis women whose charm is a certain fragrance of affection shirley is too independent for our taste and for the rest we are all in love with carolyn hellstone disinterested headstrong noble emily bronte at this time while your magical sister was weaving for you with golden words a web of fate as fortunate as dreams the true norns were spinning a paler shrouding garment you were never to see the brightest things in life sisterly love free solitude unpraised creation were to remain your most poignant joys no touch of love no hint of fame 
no hours of ease lie for you across the knees of fate neither rose nor laurel will be shed on your coffined form meanwhile your sister writes and dreams for surely terrible difference between ideas and truth wonderful magic of the unreal to take their sting from the veritable wounds we endure neither rose nor laurel will we lay reverently for remembrance over the tomb where you sleep but the flower that was always your own the wild dry heather you who were in your sister's phrase moorish wild and knotty as a root of heath you grew to your own perfection on the waste where no laurel rustles its polished leaves where no sweet fragile rose ever opened in the heart of june the storm and the winter darkness the virgin earth the blasting winds of march would have slain them utterly but all these served to make the heather light and strong to flush its bells with a ruddier purple to fill its cells with honey more pungently sweet the cold wind and the wild earth make the heather it would not grow in the sheltered meadows and you had you known the fate that love would have chosen you too would not have thrived in your full bloom another happy prosperous north country matron would be dead but now you live still singing of freedom the undying soul of courage and loneliness another voice in the wind another glory on the mountain tops emily bronte the author of wuthering heights End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of Emily Bronte by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Branwell's End. The autumn of the year eighteen forty eight was tempestuous and wild, with sudden and frequent changes of temperature and cold, penetrating wind. Those chilling blasts whirling round the small grey parsonage on its exposed hilltop brought sickness in their train anne and charlotte drooped and languished branwell too was ill his constitution seemed shattered by excesses which he had not the resolution to forego often he would sleep most of the day or at least sit dozing hour after hour in a lethargy of weakness but with the night this apathy would change to violence and suffering. Papa, and sometimes all of us, have sad nights with him, writes Charlotte in the last days of July. Yet so well the little household knew the causes of this reverse, no immediate danger was suspected. He was weak, certainly, and his appetite failed, but opium-eaters are not strong nor hungry. Neither Branwell himself nor his relations nor any physician consulted in his case thought it one of immediate danger it seemed as if this dreary life might go on forever marking its hours by a perpetual swing and rebound of excess and suffering during this melancholy autumn mr grundy was staying at skipton a town about seventeen miles from haworth mindful of his old friend he invited branwell to be his guest but the dying youth was too weak to make even that little journey, although he longed for the excitement of change. Mr. Grundy was so much moved by the miserable tone of Branwell's letter that he drove over to Haworth to see for himself what ailed his old companion. He was very shocked at the change. Pale, sunk, tremulous, utterly wrecked, there was no hope for Branwell now. He had again taken to eating opium anything for excitement for a variation to his incessant sorrow weak as he was and scarcely able to leave his bed he craved piteously for an appointment of any kind any reason for leaving haworth for getting quit of his old thoughts any post anywhere for heaven's sake so it were out of their whispering he had not long to wait later in that cold and bleak september mr grundy again visited haworth he sent to the vicarage for Branwell and ordered dinner and a fire to welcome him. The room looked cosy and warm. While Mr. Grundy sat waiting for his guest, the vicar was shown in. He, too, was strangely altered. Much of his old stiffness of manner gone, and it was with genuine affection that he spoke of Branwell, and almost with despair, that he touched on his increasing miseries. 
when mr grundy's message had come the poor self-distraught sufferer had been lying ill in bed apparently too weak to move but the feverish restlessness which marked his latter years was too strong to resist the chance of excitement he had insisted upon coming so his father said and would immediately be ready then the sorrowful half-blind old gentleman made his adieus to his son's host and left the inn presently the door opened cautiously and a head appeared it was a mass of red unkempt uncut hair wildly floating round a great gaunt forehead the cheeks yellow and hollow the mouth fallen the thin white lips not trembling but shaking the sunken eyes once small now glaring with the light of madness all told the sad tale but too surely i hastened to my friend greeted him in my gayest manner as i knew he best liked drew him quickly into the room and forced upon him a stiff glass of hot brandy under its influence and that of the bright cheerful surroundings he looked frightened frightened of himself he glanced at me a moment and muttered something of leaving a warm bed to come out in the cold night another glass of brandy and returning warmth gradually brought him back to something like the bronte of old he even ate some dinner a thing which he said he had not done for long so our last interview was pleasant though grave i never knew his intellect clearer he described himself as waiting anxiously for death indeed longing for it and happy in these his sane moments to think it was so near he once again declared that that death would be due to the story i knew and to nothing else when at last i was compelled to leave he quietly drew from his coat sleeve a carving knife placed it on the table and holding me by both hands said that having given up all hopes of ever seeing me again he imagined when my message came that it was a call from satan dressing himself he took the knife which he had long secreted and came to the inn with a full determination to rush into the room and stab the occupant in the excited state of his mind he did not recognize me when he opened the door but my voice and manner conquered him and brought him home to himself as he expressed it i left him standing bareheaded in the road with bowed form and dropping tears he went home and a few days afterwards he died that little intervening time was happier and calmer than any he had known for years his evil habits his hardened feelings slipped like a mask from the soul already touched by the final quiet he was singularly altered and softened gentle and loving to the father and sisters who had borne so much at his hands it was as though he had awakened from the fierce delirium of a fever weak though he was and shattered they could again recognize in him their branwell of old times the hope and promise of all their early dreams neither they nor he dreamed that the end was so near he had often talked of death but now that he stood in the shadow of its wings he was unconscious of that subduing presence and it is pleasant to think that the sweet demeanour of his last days was not owing to the mere cowardly fear of death but rather a return of the soul to its true self a natural dropping off of all extraneous fever and error before the suffering of its life should close half an hour before he died branwell was unconscious of danger he was out in the village two days before and was only confined to bed one single day the next morning was a sunday the twenty fourth of september branwell awoke to it perfectly conscious and through the holy quiet of that early morning he lay troubled by neither fear nor suffering while the bells of the neighbouring church and the neighbouring tower whose fabulous antiquity had furnished him with many a boyish pleasantry called the villagers to worship they all knew him all as they passed the house would look up and wonder if the vicar's patrick was better or worse but those of the parsonage were not at church they watched in branwell's hushed and peaceful chamber suddenly a terrible change came over the quiet face there was no mistaking the sudden heart-shaking summons and now charlotte sank always nervous and highly strung the mere dread of what might be to come laid her prostrate 
they led her away and for a week she kept her bed in sickness and fever but branwell the summoned the actual sufferer met death with a different face he insisted upon getting up if he had succumbed to the horrors of life he would defy the horrors of extinction he would die as he thought no one had ever died before standing so like some ancient celtic hero when the last agony began he rose to his feet hushed and awe-strucken the old father praying anne loving emily looked on he rose to his feet and died erect after twenty minutes struggle they found his pockets filled with letters of the woman he had so passionately loved he was dead this branwell who had wrung the hearts of his household day by day who drank their tears as wine he was dead and now they mourned him with acute and bitter pain all his vices were and are nothing now we remember only his woes writes charlotte they buried him in the same vault that had been opened twenty-three years ago to receive the childish wasted corpses of elizabeth and maria sunday came round recalling minute by minute the ebbing of his life and emily bronte pallid and dressed in black can scarcely have heard her brother's funeral sermon for looking at the stone which hid so many memories such useless compassion she took her brother's death very much to heart growing thin and pale and saying nothing she had made an effort to go to church that sunday and as she sat there quiet and hollow-eyed perhaps she felt it was well that she had looked upon his resting-place upon the grave where so much of her heart was buried for after his funeral she never rallied a cold and cough taken then gained fearful hold upon her and she never went out of doors after that memorable sunday but looking on her quiet uncomplaining eyes you would never have guessed so much emily and anne are pretty well says charlotte on the ninth of october though anne is always delicate and emily has a cold and cough at present End of chapter seventeen